Star Drive 117.8 You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind Hey guys, how is it going? And welcome to the Morning Star Drive on 117.8 It is Wednesday, January 3rd And so happy for you joining us We are ready to start another day together with the Lord So subscribe to us on YouTube Follow us on SoundCloud And make sure to support us on Patreon so today we have an exciting podcast for you. We have Health is Happiness, the Foundational Figures Word Study, and of course, commentaries, updates, and news on what is happening around the world in this history today. All right, everyone, how are you doing? Yes, it is Wednesday, the middle of the week, and we can say this is the middle of the first week of 2024, so I am excited and happy that uh, we've come this far. Uh, don't forget, we have Q&A Thursday tomorrow, so get those questions ready. Send them to me whenever you can. And if you haven't yet, leave uh, a like and comment for this video to build our community. Just super happy for everyone joining us every weekday on the Morning Star Drive, so let's get up and support each other each and every day. This week's Sunday message title, Those Who Reach the End by Taking Action Until the end. All right, everyone, it is hump day. It's the middle of the week. My body is wrecked. And you can tell by my voice, uh, I kind of lost my voice because it's just from playing volleyball. You know, volleyball or any sport, uh, like a team sport, it's all about communication. Everything is communication. So uh, for me, uh, it's, yeah, a lot of, you know, if you play seven games, it's a lot of talking and talking and shouting and you know cheering and stuff like that too so uh i think i gave a little too much glory on january 1st by playing volleyball yeah like my body feels like you know it's like uh when you watch ufc like those mma fighting and stuff like i feel like i i won the fight but even though i won uh my body is just wrecked right so like i had a hard time this morning i feel like i can't even move and, um, you know, probably the question of the day that I'm going to bring up to myself is how long does it take for the 46-year-old body to recover compared to a 45-year-old body, right? So, yeah, I am, my back hurts, my legs hurt, uh, my shoulders, hurt. yeah, just, I have, I have a lot of pain, a lot of pain, right? But of course, it's another new day. Uh, for me, it's January 2nd, still Tuesday for me as I'm recording this. Uh, for you guys who are listening, it's going to be Wednesday. But you know, it's um, every day. Start. It's it's uh, time to give more glory to God during this 15 days of giving glory to God. So I'm very, very excited and happy about this. Um, but one thing I was thinking about right now, as, as it's the beginning of the year, a lot of people make like New Year's resolutions and stuff like that. For me... You know, I, I think I've reached the age where I'm not like making re like resolutions. However, uh, you know, just as the end of the year is a time for uh, reflection, to look back at what we did for 2023, um, for me now that we're at the beginning of the year, it's kind of a time to look ahead. You know, looking ahead and what do I want to see from myself at the end of 2024, right? Like it's kind of like looking at what is your goal, right? Because when you look at your goal and you know exactly what you want, you have to kind of figure out like, oh, okay, so now that I know uh, what I want to do, like what I want to accomplish by the end of this year, what are the steps I need to take to get to that point, right? And I would say that, you know, we want to look at what is ideal. Like what do we, what's the most ideal situation we want for ourselves by the end of 2024? And I would also say, what is realistic, what, is, what can I realistically accomplish by the end of 2024? Now, when I say realistic, I, I don't know if it means, to, uh, you know, like, because when you, when, you, when you think of the word, when someone says to you, realistically, what do you expect? People say that because they want us to lower our expectations. You know what I mean? Like, oh, don't think way too over the top. So whenever we use the terms realistically, we use it in a way that, that kind of, tampers or tampens down our, our thoughts, like our, our expectations. Now, I do think at times there are some people that should be thinking much lower because they're thinking way too high and kind of like, you know, they're going to have be, they're going to feel down, but because they couldn't accomplish what they really wanted to do. So, you know, like there's some people like just kind of ridiculous, ridiculous, like, hey, I'm going to make a billion dollars this year and they're currently working at McDonald's. I'm like, yeah, probably that's a little bit too unrealistic, right? And then there are some things that, you know, some things that we can, you know, use to, to guide us and aid us 
in our expectations like statistics, things that people have gone through before. You know, that, and these statistics and, and uh, past experiences of others helps us to understand a proper expectation for the future too. So, but when it comes to things that have spiritual implications, right? When we think about this, when we're, when we're talking about our future, what are our expectations for ourselves? When it comes to things that have spiritual implications, uh, and when it comes to things like God is helping us, uh, or we're doing something, you know, that's not, that can't be measured, like spiritual things, I think we need to base our expectations on what God and the Holy Spirit want from us, right? And that can be a couple different things. Like, what does the Holy Spirit and God want from us? Of course, there's major things they want from us. However, if God and the Holy Spirit are helping us, then there are things like miracles that can happen, right? Like, sometimes God and the Holy Spirit will tell us. They'll tell us something that we're going to accomplish that is so unrealistic, but yet all it requires is for us to take action. You know what I mean? Like, like the Holy Spirit will give us the inspiration, this is going to happen this year, and all it requires is for us to take action. But when it comes to, you know, like things like evangelism, it's not, a stati- it's not really a statistic. People can come. We can be led to the right people, right? Uh, when it comes to us, like, uh, reviving our prayer life, reviving our uh, understanding of the Word, like, these are all spiritual things, which is much different than what happens in the physical realm. Like, let me give you an example. When Sunseem said, what's the fastest Sunseem's read the Bible? It took him three days. Now, for us, we're like, that is crazy impossible. But we do know it's possible. And we do know it's something that requires a lot of effort and a lot of consistency, right? But Sunseem read it in three days. Or Peter evangelized 3,000 people in a single day. We think to ourselves, impossible, but it actually happened, right? Remember I told you yesterday about Billy Graham? Billy Graham prayed for hours before he preached to inspire people. Like when it comes to spiritual things, we're living in a different realm. And I think it's something that we have to consider differently and we have to put ourselves into prayer to understand what we can do for this year, right? And it, it reminds me of this week's message when Sunseem said, um, you know, we don't know what, how, how much God has helped us. And it's because God's methods are spiritual. They are not the same methods the people of the world use. And that's why we can get much more accomplished. And I think that's why we need to think about that too, right? Like, uh, like the reason why this, this came up in my heart, like it came up into my mind is because God showed me something on YouTube yesterday. And it was just a quick YouTube short, but it was a statistic that was, that was really amazing. I think it was Tony Robbins that was talking about it. And what he said was, um, in, in America, I'm not sure about in uh, other countries, in America, you get paid every two weeks, right? So if you were to take out $150 out of your paycheck, so every two weeks you take out $150, and then you put it into the stock market, like a divid- like a fund or something like that, right? After eight years, how much would you have invested? And of course, if you just, that's easy mathematics, uh, you, it would come down to like $31,000 and $200, $31,200. So after eight years of taking out $150, you would have $31,000, $31,200. However, with compound interest, right? And if you look at the stock market, uh, the average return for the stock market is anywhere like 10 to 12% over the past 30 years, past 30 years, right? So uh, he says, but let's just take a, a very generous a generous percentage, let's just say 5%, half of what it, it, it's been over the last 30 years, right? So let's just say you, you gained a 5% over the last, you know, 5% instead over the next eight years and all you did was invest $150 every two weeks. How much, would you, how much money would you have at the end of it? And the answer is $1.8 million. And I was just like, wow, that's so shocking that you put in a small amount of money for every two weeks, and the total amount you invested was $31,200. But because of compound interest and a 5% annual you know, interest rate, you would have $1.8 million. Which means it's like, it's about consistency and effort. Or like, you could even say sacrifice, $150 every two weeks that you can turn $31,200 into $1.8 million. And I think that is something incredible. Like that is incredible. And the reason that made me think about this is because what I felt like what God was showing me is that uh, 
If you think about what we can do over this entire year, 365 days, well, now there's only 360, what, three days left? Yep, 362, 363 days left, right? And all we need to do is put a small amount of effort each and every day, just a small amount of effort, but it will compound and you will end up at the end of the year with something that is completely like so much greater than what you put in because of consistency, because of a little bit of sacrifice, right? If you start right now, put in the effort, whether it's exercise and this or that, then you will not end up with small outcomes. In the end, you'll have great outcomes. And that's why looking at that short 60-second video, I was like, wow, God, we can accomplish so much just by putting in a little bit of effort each and every day. It made me think a lot more deeply uh, just about consistency, right? Because imagine we were working out 200 days. Like imagine we were able to work out 200 days of the year, right? But if you were two, every 200, oh no, let's just say uh, not 200 days. Let's just say 180 days. So half the year you're able to work out. What would you look like at the end of the year? And the interesting thing is it depends. Depends on what? If you work out Every other day, because, you know, 180 days is six months, which is half the year. And all you're doing is consistently every other day you're working out every other day until the end of the year. You're going to be crazy fit. You're going to be in good shape. However, what if you went every day for 180 days straight, but then for the last six months, you don't work out at all? What are you going to look like at the end of the year? You're not going to look that great. You're, you might even be fatter than you were before. Right, depending on how you ate and what, on the different things that you did while you were, you know, for the six months you didn't work out at all, right? So it, it's very interesting that it's about this consistency, doing it, you know, as the consistently as you can every other day, every day, whatever it is, and you'll come up with a far better result. And and that made me think about, you know what? What do we want to accomplish for this year? What do we really want to accomplish? Where where do we want to be at the end of this year? And I'm saying think realistically, meaning that if we're talking about spiritual things and such, right, even financially, think about that. $150 every two weeks for eight years turns to $1.8 million. That's pretty crazy if you think about that. And if you really, really think about that even more deeply, we're like, yeah, so what about us spiritually? What do we want to end up? And I would say is we could be far better and greater and better off than we are. Like, I, I think this, like one thing Sassim did say is, you're going to get 52 Sunday messages in a year. 52. And all you need to do is every week, don't focus on five, six, ten different things a message tells you. Focus on one. And imagine every single week we change one thing about ourselves. That means by the end of the year, you'll be a brand new person because you changed 52 things about yourself by the end of 2024. And I think that's something that we really have to change our hearts and our minds about, right? So, you know, that's why I was kind of reflecting, not reflecting, looking forward. What do I want to be? Where do I want to stand at the end of this year? So that is something that I, I was really thinking about a lot more deeply too. So, you know, right now, like, uh, well, when I was preparing for this, I, I just got home to record. I was preparing for this podcast and, uh, the, uh, as I, you know, it was very, very comfortable. You know, I know the Daniel and his family are over there in, uh, Bali and I hope they're going to have a great time for me. I'm just going to rest my body. Uh, it's, you know, it's just, for me, it's just, uh, I'm not used to being that busy, Right. And, you know, with the kids, having so much fun with the kids. I am having so much fun with the family. I am an honorary baker now, so I'm part of the family. They adopted me in. But, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's not like to do that day in and day out for like I've done it for like two weeks. Just just uh, I'm not used to like so much driving and going around meeting, you know, like meeting people, you know, doing this and that like. For me, it's just because I'm, I'm not used to that type of schedule, right? So I'm, I'm just like, I'm going to get some healing done and I'm going to rest for as long as I can kind of thing. But um, uh, while I was at the cafe, I, I got this really good question from a member. And they were asking me a question about revelation receivers and why so many of them have left, right? Like, Because these are the people that saw heaven and hell. They were receiving inspiration from Jesus or the Holy Spirit. Like, wouldn't they know what they are missing, right? How could they just leave like that? And it's an interesting question, but, and, and I would say that 
one thing that I've noticed about really, really spiritual people is that they are very, very sensitive, which means they can be easily influenced by both sides. Right? Yeah, and it, it does seem very odd that these people who communicated with the Holy Trinity, with Jesus or angels, whatever it is, how could so many of them just turn out like that? And one thing that I'm certain of is that a lot of us who are not that spiritual, we won't really understand what it means to be that spiritual, right? And one thing Sun did say about really spiritual people is if they're not managed well, if they don't maintain them, their faith really well, uh, they can easily be influenced by both the good and the bad, and they wouldn't be able to recognize between the two. Right? So imagine being influenced by the Holy Trinity in Jesus or, or good spirits. And then you, you slowly stop to maintain your faith. And then all of a sudden you're getting inspiration from the other side. Right? But then they're still thinking that they're talking to the Holy Trinity in Jesus. Because, you know, I've seen this in Providence many, many times where people became too spiritual. They caused a lot more problems. They received bad revelations. Um, they would be like openly in front of the entire congregation telling people how bad they were or exposing sins in front of a congregation, which is something God would never do. God is someone who has absolute manners and he wouldn't expose people in front of other people. And this is something that we have to recognize is God is not someone uh, who exposes people exposes people's sins uh, in front of others. And that's something we do have to recognize because when you start to see people doing that, you know that there's something wrong, right? God doesn't do it that way, right? And you can see how great Sunstein's manners are too, that he will not do that to people. He actually allows people to handle their own sins on their own. He's not there to expose other people at all, right? So that is something that that people, when they notice, they're like, whoa, this is kind of weird. This Should this be happening, right? So if you ever see someone like exposing people's sins in front of others, that is a really bad sign because that is not the way the heavens would do it. The heavens are, they have great manners. The heavens really care about people and making sure that they're doing well. And that's why they won't expose. It's very, very rare that they'll expose, right? Like for instance, this whole time with KJS, Sunsim spent, you know, he had to confirm, make sure they all had time to repent. And it wasn't until like August, September that Sunsim actually started to talk about it. When everything was all said and is all done, Right? And um, it's something that I do think that we have to also have that type of same manners, that same respect for each other so that we don't expose people when they don't need to be, right? Yeah, let people handle it on their own. They'll handle it and they're done and, they move, and then they can move forward. So it is something that I looked at and said, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, we have to uh, understand that these revelation receivers they became that because they work really hard. They are very spiritual. But also on the flip side is if they turn the wrong direction, they can also be like that too. Okay? So yeah, that's kind of the things that I was, you know, that's, it's, it's a very, very good question. But I'm sure that, you know, Sunsim will in the future talk about it even more. But, you know, it's, a lot of it we have seen where a lot of revelation receivers started to receive revelations and then they receive wrong revelations. And even when Sunsim says it's wrong, they still continue on their path kind of thing. Right, which means that they've lost the head. They shouldn't have done it that way, kind of thing. So, that is quite an interest. I think that's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, but great questions, and uh, a lot. And there are some more questions that this person gave, and I'll talk about that during the uh, Q and A Thursday tomorrow too. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, today is Wednesday. We have service tonight. Um, today we have foundational figures word study, and today we're going to talk about someone named Jonathan Edwards. Okay, we're going to get into this because this is more recent times. A lot of the people that I talked about are from like the mid, you know, uh, like the 1500s, 1400s, and also like at the early Christian church times. I'm going to talk about a little bit more recent people. We're talking 18th, 19th century too. And I'm going to talk about something called the Great Awakening. Okay, and uh, I hope you guys will enjoy this, but it has to do with one of the people who uh, was a major contributor in the Great Awakening. This is Jonathan Edwards. All right, so before we get into the Foundation of Figures word study, let's get into the first break of the day. Lift me 
up from falling. I feel your warm embrace, breathing life into my withering spirit, pouring out your love and grace. So I think to myself, I'll repay you. Ooh, oh. You pulled me out of darkness. So many thousands of times You gave me strength and courage Everything that I need in life Look at all the countless blessings I'll repay you Ooh, oh. Even if the world forsakes you And they misunderstand What it means to be in providence Holding God's truth in our hands We fulfill the greatest history God's will and highest love All the wondrous miracles you've shown Only here in Providence Providence Push forward, we'll run Till the end With our solid faith We'll repay you with all our heart, will and life. Now the seals are broken, the treasure's now revealed You've shared his highest wisdom, valued secrets of how to live Looking back at all the memories, I'll repay you Ooh, oh. Even if the world forsakes you and they misunderstand what a blessing it is that you're here Acting with God hand in hand We've received the greatest rapture We've gained eternal joy This is God's final history Never will it be destroyed Providence will shine our brightest light For your dreams Your work will be earth that will preach Gain all that you want To achieve Even if the world forsakes you And they don't understand We're more than proud to be here Holding God's truth in our hands We fulfill the greatest history God's will and highest love your words, your precious providence We'll cherish it till the end Providence We'll stand till the end Providence We'll live with our God Providence Love God with our heart Will and life All right, so let's get into today's word study. And uh, every Wednesday, we do have the Foundational Figures of Christianity word study. And today, we're going to go over someone named Jonathan Edwards. Okay, Jonathan Edwards. And I hope that uh, you guys will really enjoy this. And he's a key figure of the Great Awakening. Okay, and we want to get into this a little, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the Great Awakening before I get into Jonathan Edwards. Okay, so um, this is something that happened in America, right? So many of the early Puritans and pilgrims that came to America, they came with fervent faith. They had a vision for establishing a godly nation. And within a century, uh, what happened was that fire actually cooled down. So the children of the original immigrants were more concerned with increasing wealth and comfortable living than furthering the kingdom of God. Now, that same spiritual malaise could be found throughout the American colonies. 
So the what happened was there was this like this philosophical rationalism of the enlightenment that was spreading its influence among the educated classes. And, you know, of course, others were just preoccupied with, you know, their life in the world. So there was a, a very a big minister of the Dutch Reformed Church, and his name was Theodore Freilinghusen, right? And he began, he came to begin his pastoral work, uh, came to begin his uh, pastoral work in New Jersey during the 1720s. And what he found, he was so shocked by the deadness of the churches in America. So he preached the need for conversion, right? Like true conversion, profound, life-changing commitment to Christ, not just someone who's just attending church every week, right? So, uh, it was not only him, but he influenced something, uh, someone, a Presbyterian, his name is Gilbert Tennant, and uh, he, they kind of brought a revival to the denom- denomination of Presbyterianism, right? So Tennant believed the deadness of the churches was in part due to so many pastors having never been converted themselves. And he actually wrote a book on it called The Dangers of the Unconverted Ministry. And of course, that caused quite a riot over there during that time. So how did this Great Awakening actually begin? So um, people would say that the Great Awakening actually began years earlier, probably in the 1720s, although the most significant years was 1740 to 1742, right? And of course, the revival continued into the 1760s, but many of the early colonists had come to the new world to enjoy religious freedom. But as the land became tamed and prosperous, they no longer relied on God for their daily bread. So wealth brought complacency towards God, which is like the message where some seems saying that don't be comfortable, right? And as a result, church membership dropped, So wishing to make it easier to increase church attendance, the religious leaders had instituted the halfway covenant, which allowed membership uh, without a public testimony of conversion. So the churches were now uh, attended largely by people who lacked a personal relationship with Jesus. And sadly, many, many of the ministers themselves did not know Christ and therefore could not lead their flocks to the true shepherd. And then suddenly the spirit of God awoke as uh as though from an intense slumber and began to touch the population of the colonies. So people from all walks of life, from poor farmers to rich merchants, began experiencing renewal and rebirth. Okay, So the faith and prayers of the righteous leaders were the foundation of the Great Awakening. Uh, And even before a meeting, there was um, someone named George Whitefield would spend hours and sometimes all night bathing an event in just prayers. So fervent church members kept the fires of revival going through their genuine petitions for God's intervention in the lives of their communities. And then the early rays of the Great Awakening began with Theodore Frelinghuysen of the Dutch Reformed Church in New Jersey. And through his ministry, the hearts of the church members were changed. And it was the young people who responded first and experienced the regeneration of becoming new creations. And they in turn spread the message to their elders. Thus began the first spark of the Great Awakening. Okay, so uh, this is where we get into... Uh, Jonathan Edwards. So 1727 is about the time that Freeling, uh, Freeling Husen and Tennant were seeing a revival in New Jersey and uh, Jonathan Edwards went to Northampton, Massachusetts to become assistant minister to his grandfather. Okay, so this is where, now you got guys have kind of an idea of the Great Awakening. So let's go into Jonathan Edwards. Okay, so Jonathan Edwards was born in 1703, uh, about 70 years after the first Puritan settlement of New England, okay? And at that time, there was about 130 towns in the colony. Some were well-established, others were small and on the frontiers of the wilderness. And he, uh, Jonathan Edwards spent his first 12 years in his parents' home at East Windsor, close to the Connecticut River. Now, his father, Timothy, was pastor of the local church, a good student, good preacher, as well as a part-time school teacher and farmer. His mother, Esther, had 11 children, four girls, uh, then Jonathan, to be followed by six more girls, and all of them six feet tall or higher. Okay, that's pretty crazy, right? So of the largest family circle, his maternal grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, was pastor of the largest church in New England, some 35 miles away in Northampton, right? So we're, we're looking at a very, very spiritual family. His grandfather and father were pastors. Now, Jonathan would appear to have had a healthy and happy childhood, spent largely in female company. Yes, he has 10 sisters. And uh, when he was almost 13, 
Uh, he was sent down uh, river to the Collegiate School of Connecticut. Two years later, the school settled at New Haven and became Yale. The head was one of Edward's many cousins, uh, Elisha Williams. Okay, Edwards graduated Bachelor of Arts 1720, and it was decided he would stay further uh, a further two years to become a Master of Arts. And one year le later, however, in the spring of 1721, something far more important happened. So Edwards at this time was already religious, but despite repeated resolutions, it was not a religion that had changed his heart or humbled his natural pride. But now he says, "I was brought to that new sense, brought to that new sense of things." to an inward sweet delight in God and divine things, quite different from anything I ever experienced before. I began to have a new kind of apprehension and ideas of Christ and the work of redemption and the glorious way of salvation by him. That's what he said, right? So Edward's concern was to see Christ's kingdom extended, right? And this is where it kind of all started. So before con concluding his Masters of Arts, he went to serve first, uh, he went to serve uh, at the First Presbyterian Church in New York at the age of 19. And basically he said this was an amazing time for him. And uh, he preached sermons in New York uh, and people thought he was remarkably, re by listening to his sermons, the congregation looked at him as remarkably mature. But of course there were those, including his father, who wanted him back in Connecticut. And from 1724 to 1726, he joined the staff at Yale as a tutor. And these were years of preparation. Uh, this took years of preparation. And at 1726, brought the great milestone of his life. For that year, 1726, saw him invited to join his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, now aged 83, and still the minister in Northampton. And meanwhile, something even more significant had happened. As a teenager, uh, Jonathan fall, fell in love with a girl who lived with her mother close to the College Green in New Haven. And her name was Sarah uh, Pierrepont. And on July 28, 1727, 17 years old and dressed in pea green satin brocade, she married Jonathan and became his inseparable helper. Now, when he went to Northampton, a town of some 200 homes, mostly clustered together for defense, had a population of about 1,000 men, women, and children. So the couple set up home on a rural lane, right, and were given 10 acres and uh, a further 40... Uh, uh, and a further 40, uh, about five miles away. A year later, the first of their children was born. And in the next 22 years, the family grew until there were eight daughters and three sons. Now, the first seven years at Northampton were ones of hard work and happiness as Edward settled into the habits of a lifetime, right? One concern, however, was to deepen, uh, was to deepen as he grew to, uh, one second, sorry, that was someone calling. Uh, he grew to understand his congregation more for the next seven years, right? And his people made up the only church in the town. And according to the early New England pattern, the whole population uh, regarded it as their own. So when Stoddard died in 1729, the oversight fell entirely on Edwards. So the Northampton church was as eminent as any in the land, but it seems that it had come to rely too much on what it had been. Its spiritual condition did not come up to Edward's expectation, and his sermons increasingly revealed that he saw too many of his hearers as no more than nominal believers, right? And what, what Jonathan said was, they come to meeting from one Sabbath to another and hear God's word, but all that can be said to them, said to, um, to them won't awaken them and won't persuade them to take, to take pains that they may be saved. And often he feared such people were not even listening, so, you know, like, and Jonathan would say, like, they're gazing about the assembly, minding this and the other person that is in it, or they are thinking of their worldly business. So this state of affairs came to an end in one of the best known events of Edward's life, which was the revival of 1734 to 35, when, in his words, a great and earnest concern about the great things of religion and the eternal world became universal in all parts of the town. He thought it probable that 300 had been converted within six months. And it was his hope that the greatest part of uh, persons in this town above 16 years of age are such as having, uh, have the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, right? So Edwards wrote an account of the awakening, which was published under the title, A Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God. 
and the book drew widespread attention and instantly put Edwards and the Northampton Church on the world stage. And this appears to have been the occasion of a family quarrel that was to go on through the rest of Edwards' lifetime, particularly involving cousins on his mother's side, the Williams. So the revival did not continue. It is clear that by 1736, Edwards was again struggling with the difficulties of more normal church life, and there was cause for some disappointment in his anticipations of the permanent results of the revival, and they weren't fulfilled, right? So it, basically, it was kind of like this endemic in the village, and it kind of just reappeared in 1736. But in 1740, a work of grace much wider in scale began along the eastern seaboard. It was the beginning of the Great Awakening, uh, which would touch several places in the 13 colonies of the fledgling nations. So for Edwards, the Great Awakening years were exhausting times which brought him to the brink of the grave. Besides the care of his own people, he was now itinerating widely to preach for other men. So correspondence multiplied, and yet somehow he was also preparing two of the most significant books ever written on the subject of revival. The first was Distinguishing Marks of a Work of the Spirit of God, and the second book was Thoughts on the Revival in New England. Yet for him, these were happy years. And at one point, there was fear, uh, there was fear that his wife, Sarah, would die of sheer joy. So the blessing of the early 1740s was followed by a longer period of difficulty when two major problems confronted Edwards almost simultaneously. First, in the wider scene in New England, opposition developed to the very idea of the awakening as a work of the Spirit of God. Some by foolish behavior and lives lacking in Christ-likeness gave just cause for criticism. Some of these people were fanatics, people who saw physical phenomena as sure uh, as like surefire proof of the Spirit's work and presence. The wildfire they represented gave support to the arguments of those who wished to discredit the whole work. In addition to this, in every revival, there is a work of the Spirit on large numbers of individuals who express spiritual concern and their lives take on new seriousness, but it doesn't last. And in time, there is a return to their formal, uh, former indifference and formal religion. And with pain, Edwards had to recognize that in Northampton itself, the number of true converts was not what he had once hoped. The other great difficulty which Edwards now experienced was that support from his own congregation was weakening, and one cause of this was the hostility of certain members of his wider family circle. So during the 1740s, Edwards had come to disagree with his grandfather Stoddard's long-established practice of not requiring a profession of saving faith in Christ in order to be, uh, you know, um, a believer in the church. But Stoddard's name was already a legend, and when his grandson disagreed with the great man, and when people knew about this, there was an uproar in that town, right? And of course, the Williams family involved as usual. So the final extraordinary outcome was being voted out of his own church. The great majority of the 230 male communicants voted for his removal. And the tragedy deepens when Edwards writes that most of them esteemed me to be the chief instrument in the hand of God of the eternal salvation of their souls. So one of the most fruitful pastorates in history ended up uh, on June 22nd, 1750. And Edwards was now 46 at this time. Uh, no financial arrangement was offered to help them, and for the best part of the year, apart from some temporary engagements, he remained unemployed. Then he accepted a call to an improbable situation. Now, Stockbridge was a village in the frontier wilderness, 40 miles from Northampton, and with a congregation of about a dozen white families. And one factor that added to the appeal of Stockbridge was the presence of Indians and the existence of a school for Indian children. So after difficulties in selling their Northampton home, the whole family was eventually settled on the frontier by 1751. Now for Edwards, Stockbridge was a haven of peace compared with the turmoil he had left behind. But it was not long before the family of Williamses at Stockbridge were showing all the prejudice and hostility that had marked the other members of the same clan. The Stockbridge Williamses had their own ambitious plans in which material gain seems to have played no small part, and they wished for no oversight from anyone of Edward's stature. So for three years, 
There was to be another painful struggle, but this time the congregation stood with their pastor and so did the Indians whom the Williamses had antagonized. Only in 1754 did the Williamses in Stockbridge give up and the strife was over. Yet there were other trials, including persistent financial constraints, and then with the outbreak of war with the French, the whole frontier situation became exposed to attack. Now, one of Edward's daughters, Esther, visited her parents and family at Stockbridge in the summer of 1756 and was filled with alarm at the danger of their situation. The next year, Esther's husband, Aaron Burr, President of Nassau Hall, the college in New Jersey recently established at Princeton, died and Edwards was uh, surprised to learn that the decision of the college trustees was that, was that he should be his son-in-law's successor. He didn't want to accept it. And when the, appro uh, and when, uh, the approaches to him continued, Edwards referred to the decision to a council of friends and they concluded that he should go to Princeton. The only time in his life when he, when kind of, the only time in his life when, uh, when people say that he actually shed tears. And one major reason for his reluctance was that he now believed that he could be more useful by writing than by speaking, and he had a number of potential books in hand. Now, given the urgency of the need at Princeton, Edwards left Sarah and most of his family behind at Stockbridge when he left in 1758. And that was January. And as he left his home for the last time, his daughter remembered when he had got out of uh, got out of doors, he turned about and he says, I commit you to God. And uh, Edwards was now 54 and he spoke of his health being stronger than previously. But the next month, an inoculation uh, against smallpox went wrong. And on March 22nd, 1758, he died at Princeton. 16 days after her father, Esther also died at Princeton, leaving two orphan children. Sarah hurried down from Stockbridge to care for them, only to die herself and be buried with her husband at Princeton in October 1758. So, yeah, that's kind of the story of Jonathan Edwards. But I hope it's something that uh, we realize. This, this He was a very a major figure of the Great Awakening in uh, in in the Americas. And when you listen to what happens, it kind of reminds us of today how comfort sets in people are more concerned about their their like their life their finances more than god and that's kind of what happens uh even, we're seeing even today with christianity so i hope it's something that we can learn from and understand that sometimes we need a great revival like maybe obviously when i talk about the holy spirit movement we have some negative things that come to mind but we need those things and with those things we're able to bring ourselves back to god in the right way right so yeah, uh, very, very, uh, it's a very, very interesting story. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. This is a story of uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards. If you have any questions or if, uh, if there are other people, foundational figures you want me to go over, go ahead and leave them in the comments below. All right. So uh, there it is, guys. That is today's foundational figures word study. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Let's move into uh, the second break of the day. Not a man in disguise, the hardest cross to bear. Such 
hearts know what I wear To think this effort and this love Could overcome the dirty stairs And it's all because of you Yeah, it's all because of you Said it's all because of you Yeah, I need you Someone to haunt, 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 someone to haunt,
Today, purple Akiba can be found in limited quantities at special markets and grocers in Japan, China, and Korea. The fruits are also grown on a very small scale across Europe, New Zealand, and in the United States. So Sun Slim talked about this fruit in a message that was given towards the end of September 2021. Uh, it was titled, The One Who Does Things Till the End Triumphs. He mentioned how the fruit is in, uh, it's in a famous Chinese medicine book, although I'm not sure exactly which one he's referring to. But he said that the fruit has about six to seven unique qualities about it. Number one, it's really good for your blood circulation. He also said, number two, he asked the Holy Spirit and found that it was good for infections. It's really, really good for preventing infections. Number three, it clears up your mind. Sun Sin was explaining how people say that it clears your mind so much that it can help you predict the future. Of course, I think this was a figure of speech. Number four, it also lowers your blood pressure. Number five, you should eat the seeds too, but you have to let it soak in your mouth for a long time before you can chew them. And if you swallow it after that, it will prevent constipation. Number six, you should also dry the peel. And if you use it to make tea, then it's really good for you as well. So those were the notes I was able to capture from the message. I may have missed one more. But anyways, I went and did some more research on the benefits of Akibia. And this is what I found. So there's certain pills that are made with the with Akibia seeds. And these um, certain seeds, depending on the specimen, when they're taken, they're really, really good for headaches and migraines. And also the parts of the plant, like the root, if they're used to make tea or the dried peel, as Sun Sanim said, it's really, really good for your mental well-being. Also, akebia can be used to help treat problems with urination as well. It's also a very good anti-inflammatory agent, which helps with arthritis, joint pain, back pain, swelling, and redness. It's also a powerful diuretic, which means it helps with water retention, urinary challenges, and reducing blood pressure. It's, great, it's also a great agent for soothing away irritations of the stomach and kidneys, thus helping prevent further disease, diseases in these organs. Being a very good anti-inflammatory agent, it also helps detoxify and soothe the liver. Akibia is also a very good antibiotic herb for getting rid of bacterial infections. For example, it really helps with urinary tract infections. It's high in potassium, which is good for the heart, contractions, and water regulation. The dried stems made into a tea are very good also for pain relieving. It also increases circulation to all parts of the body, including the heart. So there you have it. That's the Akibia. Now, in the same message, as I mentioned before, Sansanim also talked about acorns. More specifically, acorn powder. In the sermon, he mentioned specifically how it's really good for liver detoxing. Now, acorn is a nut that I think everyone knows about. It comes from the oak tree, and we often think of it as squirrel food, at least in Western countries. However, for thousands of years, till today, acorns are widely used in China, Japan, and Korea. Native Americans also used acorns a lot in their food. They have many great properties for health. You can enjoy them dry roast or in the form of acorn flour used to make bakery goods in the form of acorn powder. And it's commonly used to make acorn jelly. Or you can simply add it to milk with some honey and consume it as a beverage, which is how Sun Sinim had suggested uh, to consume as well. And it's an excellent source of carbohydrates, dietary fiber and healthy fat. And this combination ensures that it helps you stay full for a long time. In addition to this, acorns are a very good source of protein, vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin E. The presence of these mineral vitamins makes them very beneficial for the eyes, skin, brain, and immune system. 
While also doing further research into the health benefits of acorns, I came across the following. Compounds present in acorns inhibit the action of an enzyme called alpha glucosidase. I have no idea how to pronounce that. Alpha glucosidase. I think that's correct. Anyways, what this does is it delays the digestion of carbohydrates and slowing down the conversion of carbohydrates into simple sugar. This further prevents spike in the blood glucose during digestion. Also due to the, this attribute and its high fiber content, acorns can really contribute to the management of diabetic diseases. Next, acorns are also rich in minerals such as calcium potas and potassium and thus making them very beneficial for the bones and muscles and also individuals with high blood pressure. Next, antioxidants present in acorns also inhibit this particular enzyme which I won't mention because it's too hard to pronounce. But anyways, inhibiting this enzyme lowers the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease such as confusion, memory loss, and inability to think and concentrate. It lowers the level of oxidative stress and prevents the death of brain cells. Gaelic acid present in acorns possess also, also possess brain protective properties, thus further aiding the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. Next, the presence of tannins and unsaturated fatty acids in acorns results in beneficial effects on blood cholesterol levels. Tannins help to reduce LDL, which is bad cholesterol, and triglyceride levels. They inhibit the enzyme that leads to the production of cholesterol in the body. Tannins also promote the excretion of cholesterol and reduce its absorption. So there you have it. Now you know a bit more about the acorn and the achevia. After mentioning the properties of these foods, Sansanim actually used this as a parable at the very end of that sermon to say, in the same way, the word is really good to help you fix and heal your spiritual diseases. However, you also need to know how to actually process the word to get the full benefits. That's such a perfect parable, don't you think? On that note, we'll end today's episode here. Please drop a comment below on something that stood out to you. I hope that you found that useful and I'll be sharing some more of these in upcoming episodes. In particular, what Sansanim said about how to stay young. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time. And thank you so much, Julius, for a wonderful episode of Health is Happiness. What did Sunsinim say? It's about health, too. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any comments, go leave them below. Julius, uh, I believe he's still in Africa at this moment on vacation, going to visit his home. And I hope that um, he has safe travels. Uh, everyone, I hope you guys have an amazing and awesome Wednesday. Tonight is the service, so please uh, enjoy the service. Listen to the words deeply as we're at the beginning of the year and I hope that we can start our, start our 2024 in a powerful fashion, all right? So there it is, guys. That is today's Wednesday podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. We'll see you guys again tomorrow on the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. The morning star drive on 17.8. You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride, and it's time to fly. So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm like this. I got my head in the zone, you know. I'm on the morning star drive, you know. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm like Zone, you know, I'm on the morning star drive, you know.